precious Heavenly Father, we want to come to you again this morning. We want to thank you for the rest that we received throughout the night. And now we just thank you for the precious opportunity of coming before your feet again. We ask that your Holy Spirit will um, lead and guide our thoughts and our words. But most of <coughs> just ask now that you be with Brother Parminder and that you direct his mind and his words that they leave impressions upon our minds of the precious truth that you want us to understand and um, clarify in our own lives. And we want to thank you for every blessing that you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. As you know, I'm going to be away for just under two weeks. So this is our last um, morning study together for a while. So I just wanted to recap some of the things that we've discussed <coughs> since, um, since we started. It's funny, when I think about it, it, it seems that we, we, it's not the only time this happened, it's happened before to me. You think, we haven't actually gone through that much. <coughs> I don't think you've covered that much material, but um, I was reviewing my notes <coughs> and going over the material that we have covered, and it's quite a lot of things that we've, we've looked at. So I'm just going to make a quick list, um, and if you think I've missed anything, then um, ju just add, add to that. But this is just a short list of, of what I think we've covered. When, once we've done the list, then if you've got any questions on any of those things, let, let's, let's discuss them. Um, so we've looked at the visions. This is in Daniel chapter eight to ten, and, and we, it, it's still a work in progress. We haven't finished, um, and the part of the reason that we haven't finished it is because we still don't have consensus between ourselves exactly what these visions are referring to. So the three visions are the Hazon. the Marais vision and the Marah vision. Then we had a, a, a quick look at the kings of Medo-Persia. And we went to Daniel 11 verse 2. We've looked at Daniel 7, 8, 9 and 10. And we had a review of that. We've looked at the 70 years. <coughs> 70 years still isn't sorted out because it, it's, turning a lot, it's turning out a lot more complicated than at least I realised, or I initially thought. We looked at the first and the third year of Cyrus. And this is in connection with Daniel chapter 10 and the fact that the decree um, to release Israel is given in the first year of his reign. But in Daniel chapter 10, it says the third year of Cyrus. And there seems to be information in Daniel 10 that would <coughs> infer that the events of um, Daniel chapter 10 <coughs> are to do with the release of God's people. So there's um, something that needs sorting out between the first year and the third year. And that still hasn't been resolved. Um, we've looked at the history of these kings in a bit more detail. But not only the Medo-Persian kings, but also the kings of Judah. We've, we, we, we went back and we, we reviewed more material on the visions. Then we looked at the second Passover. Sister Tiffany, do you remember what chapter, what book you find the second Passover? Numbers. Numbers. Where did we look at? Where did we go to? Second Chronicles. Second Chronicles. So we looked at 2 Chronicles chapter 30. Then we looked at Carchemish. Then we looked at the word hissing. 
Then we looked at Daniel chapter 8 and chapter 9 briefly. We haven't <coughs> done an extensive review of that. Then we've looked at Nineveh. And recently we've been looking at Daniel chapter 2. So these 70 years is connected with the time of the end. What have we understood about the vision so far? What have we discussed? What, what conclusions? <coughs> I know we haven't got a, a, a complete consensus of this. What's your question? The visions. What information have we discussed? What, what thoughts have we got the about them? Is, uh, so we've said that the Hazon is prophetic history. The Marie, the appearance, the appearance of Christ, <coughs> and the Marah, the looking, glass, the, looking glass, the looking glass. We haven't really spent a, a lot of time looking at all the verses that deal with that, but what I'm, what I'm going to put is I'm just going to put response and looking glass. Do we understand why I've done that? Yes, because they're connected. Because they're connected. And when we look at the um, morale vision, it's going to give us different characteristics. There are different things that it's trying to teach us. One of the things it tries to teach us is that when you see Christ, it, it creates a response in you. There's a cause and effect relationship between those two visions. But on top of that, um, there are other Bible verses that deal with this issue of the looking glass. So there, there are subtle differences between the two. It has this twofold, not twofold meaning, um, but it brings, it brings more light to us than just the fact that when you see Christ that you're humbled in the dust. There's, there's more to the morale vision than that, but we haven't spent time dealing with that. The kings of Medo-Persia. Why did we look at that initially? What, why were we looking at the kings of Medo-Persia? Sorry? Seven thunders? Uh, we didn't really address this. It wasn't, it wasn't through the seven thunders. Daniel 11 verse 2. And why were we looking at Daniel 11 verse 2, Brother Henry? Why did we start looking at that? Do you recall? Brother Jonathan. The rich king. The rich king. Yeah. The fourth king, who, the fourth king of the Medes and Persians, who is far richer than them all. And what's he going to do? Stir up the realm of Grisha. Stir up the realm of Grisha. <coughs> and so we tentatively looked at some uh, you know, present application for that and, and that's where this issue of um, the presidential candidate uh, Donald Trump came up. So we looked at that. Then we looked at the 70 year captivity and what were we looking at there? Time of the end. Right? Time of the end. The time of the end. We're looking at the time of the end. And it was in connection with Daniel 11 too, right? It's What's all in connection with that, yeah. And, and what is the problem with this issue? If it's a point or a period. A point or a period. So there's something to do with the dates. What are the dates? 538 and 536. What happens in 538? Babylon falls. So we've marked this as the first year of Darius. And... What chapter would you go to for this? Daniel 5. Go to Daniel 9. And Daniel And Daniel 6, yes. 536? Yeah. I didn't hear someone said something. Of <coughs> so 536, and Ellen White marks this as the end of the 70 years. The the ascension or the first year of Cyrus, but there are many indicators to tell us that 538 is the time of the end. So we can talk about a period and a point in time, but what, what are we beginning to see? We're beginning to see that when we talk about any history, whether it's the time of the end 
or the Sunday law, that, it, that we, we have prophetic markers, we have a, a specific date, or we have 1798, 1989, but it's always connected with a period of time. So there's this period of time at one level, but it's also a point in time. And it's not just some kind of esoterical thing. You actually see it in, in the verses in the history that's surrounding that. And if you don't factor that in, you, you can get into problems. And this is part of the... It, it can go past the time of the end. Yes, yes. And this is part of the problem that some people were having yesterday in Brother Michael's um, presentation in the evening about when you come to the division of Rome here, we, do we want to mark that as a singular event? Or, it, or is it, does it cover some kind of period of time? And it, and it throws people out. So we, we always need to remember that. Um, we looked at the history of the kings of Judah. And what, where did we begin? Uh, which king did we, we, did we really start to look at? We went before Josiah, we went to King Ahaz, we went to King Ahaz and we saw <coughs> or we showed that King Ahaz in Isaiah 7 is bringing us to the year 742 and then from 742 through the prophecy of the 65 years in Isaiah 7, uh, Isaiah 7 we can get to the year 677. So that's how, this is the, this is the well-established chronologi chronological date. We, that's quite easy to, to secure, but that's how we get 677 from the 65-year time prophecy. Then how do we get 723? Within. So we could, but if we just left it as within, it wouldn't give us a date, would it? Because we wouldn't know how to, we wouldn't know what to do with that. So how do we get the date? Well, if you do that, you'd, you'd end up going back here and working backwards. Yeah. You could do that. Because of Pekka and Hoshea. Something to do with Hoshea. Yeah. King, Ho king, king Hoshea is the last king of, yeah. of the ten tribes of, of Israel. So we make a connection between something that's going on in Judah and something that's going on in Israel. And who are the kings that are involved in that? The names. They're not the king of the north and the king of the south. It's not Pekka. Pekka is an Israelite king. It's Hezekiah. So there are two connections between Hezekiah and Hoshea. Do you remember what the connections are? They're co-reigning. They're co-reigning, but do you remember the, 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 what the co-reigns of the years are? The Hezekiah is the fourth year. The fourth, and Hoshea is the seventh. The seventh. And then we have another one. Hezekiah is the sixth and Hoshea is the ninth. Yeah. Yeah? yeah. So it's through a connection from Ahaz then into the reign of Hezekiah and then his connection with Hoshea that you're able to get 723. <coughs> Remember that. That's establishing the chronology. Yes. So we, we really need to know that to establish how we get the, the logic for getting 723 and the logic for getting 670. 677 is the 65-year time prophecy, but 723 is from the relationship between these two kings. So we looked at the history of the kings, and then we went down from Hezekiah. Obviously, this is Manasseh. And then we went into Josiah, but we'll look at Josiah in a moment. And then why did we look at the second Passover, Second Chronicles chapter 30? What were we discussing then? <coughs> Brother Alice, Sister Alison, do you remember? No. Sister Sarah? <coughs> do you remember? Wh wh why Second Chronicles comes into this story? <coughs> The Israel king for the Passover. 
That's you right. You restored the, te the temple and then they had a pestle. And who's that king? Hezekiah. 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 So right in this history here, <coughs> Hezekiah is going to invite the nation of Israel to this Passover, this second Passover. And why is that important? What, did, what would we see that that represented? It's the last call for the nation of Israel. We, we read that, uh, the Spirit of Prophecy passage, you have notes of that. It was their last call before the destruction was about to happen. So before the siege begins here, so this is where we're going to mark the siege. The siege begins here and it lasts for how many years? Two or three. Don't get distracted by the numbers. It, it, it's a three year siege because this is the first, the second and the third. So it's a three year siege and before the siege is going to happen, so we're right in this period here, Hezekiah is going to come to the throne, Second Chronicles chapter 29, he's going to sanctify and cleanse the temple complex in a two step process. So how did he do that? Second Chronicles 29. What, what does it teach us there? So it says on the first day of the first month, they begin to do that work. Do you know say all of this, Sister Alison? Is this making any sense? <laughs> okay, Brother Henry, do you recall any of this? Okay, so then we get to the eighth day of the first month and the sixteenth day of the first month. And just from the history of this, you can see <coughs> that they've missed a Passover. Passover has been missed because you, the sanctuary hasn't been cleansed in time because Passover is on what day? 14th. So they've got a dilemma. They dedicate the, the temple here, but they still want to keep a Passover. So what they do is they skip a whole month and then they go to the 14th day of the second month. And in this time period here, <coughs> so here's the Passover. And in this time period, what's going on? Sorry? Right? This is the call. So this is the call that's being made to those, uh, the, 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 the ten tribes. And this is before the siege that's going on here. So this is their last call. Do we have any questions about that? No? Okay, so let me ask you a question. If it, so that means you're reasonably happy with that. So if we have the first day of the first month here, Most of us have an understanding of Ezra chapter 7, where it talks about the first year of the first month. And do we have at least some kind of understanding how we're going to get the first year of the first month and transfer it into 9-11? Do we have some kind of understanding of how that happens? So it's, it's the tarrying time? Did we use Saul? Sorry? Did we use Saul? Saul, did you say? Yeah. No, you, you, um, Josiah, yeah. not Josiah. It's the resurrection okay. of the sanctuary. So the coming out of Babylon. Okay, so there's coming out of Babylon. Mm -hmm. You want to put the calling of the priests, but we need to go back to what history to to. So we're, yeah, Ezra 7.9 is going to pick this up, but we need to go back to Millerite history. 
So what's Millerite history going to teach us? Not the prediction. So this is a disappointment. And what's the date for the disappointment? April the 19th. So this is April the 19th. What year, Sister Alison? 1844. And this is what in Carite Reckoning, Brother Henry? In Carite Reckoning, this date here. Not August, we're, we're in April. In Carite Reckoning, what would we call this? Or Jewish Reckoning? So we really want to. Yeah, don't help. Don't help. <laughs> okay, so this is the first day of the first month. Does that, do you remember why that is? Let's have a quick review then. So this is January to January or to December. <coughs> and then you're going to have January to December. This is 18... 43, 1844, yeah? This is Gregorian time. So the Jews run from spring to spring, so they're gonna run their years like this. And what the Millerites do, they have a very sophisticated way of combining these two together. So they're gonna say that this is the year 1843, and this is the year 1844. So you can see here, this is the spring of 44. And when you do all the maths of the spring, it comes out that it's 19th of April that that date is. So you, you, I know you remember that, yeah? So that's why, we, that's why we're going to mark that. So we've got the first day of the first month there. And... How are we going to transfer 19th of April, 1844, 1st of the first month, and how are we going to transfer that into 9-11? Um, in April 19th, the during time started, and we know that there is the arrival of the second angel. Okay, so we've got... How's the tarrying time? If you're going to say the tarrying time arrives, how does that help with 9-11? Well, the arrival of the second angel, the, 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 the message of the second angel is Babylon is fallen, is fallen. That's the same angel that comes down at 9-11. Okay, but I'm asking you, you mentioned we're going we're gonna to prove it's 9-11 mm -hmm. because of the tarrying time. No, because of the arrival of the second angel. Okay, so the tarrying time, we're not, that's not the proof. You can use it. Show me how you're going to use tarrying time to prove that then. No, I'm not using that to prove it. I, I'm, okay, because you, but you did say that. That's what I'm, I, I, I prove it by the, the second angel. Okay, I'll go with that, Sister Tamina. But how, do you, how does that define 9-11? Because Christ is coming down and he's close to the clouds. Okay, so you're going to say that Christ is coming down. How do you... How do you prove it's you got, you, You've got 19th of <coughs> April and you can show that that's the first day of the first month. And then we want to show that 19th of April, 1st of the first month, is 9-11. And I'm saying, how do we go about doing that? How do you prove that the 1st of the first month is 9-11? But it's just the second angel. So he said the second angel, but the first thing he said was the tarrying time. So then I asked, well, how does the tarrying time show you that... You, you, you can demonstrate that in Millerite history, the 1st of the first month is the tarrying time. You can do... But how does that, how does that transfer over to 9-11? But I mean, that's the arrival of the second angel. Well, yeah. for a second argument. Oh, another one. Brother Arian gave us two arguments. He said tarrying time. So I'm only dealing with that tarrying time at the moment. So I'm saying, how does that show you that it's 9-11? So he wasn't, able, he wasn't sure when he said so. Sister Tamina says that Christ is coming down in a cloud. So she's picking up the cloud. <coughs> is that right? That's what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah? And... It says when the cloud comes down, the cloud becomes a symbol of what, Brother Aaron? It becomes a symbol of what? <coughs> to, 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 
Tarrying. becomes a symbol of tarrying. Yeah? Mm-hmm. So, what does it mean when she said Christ is coming down? Because now she's, she's introduced this concept that Christ comes down with a cloud. So the cloud has become the symbol of tarrying. Yeah, we, okay, we, so, cloud, um, so we've got the cloud. But she's, she's introduced this other thought that Christ is coming down. Mm-hmm. Sorry? And what are you referring to there? Um, well, because... Uh, a Bible chapter verse. Yeah, okay, so you're thinking August the 11th, 1840, Christ comes down, and you can show through another line of logic that this parallels 9-11. So when Christ comes down, <coughs> he's coming down with a cloud, and the cloud becomes a symbol of the Tarian time. So the, the, the first piece of logic that you said First day of the first month is 9-11 because of tarrying time. So we've got that. And then the second one is more straightforward <coughs> that we're talking about the second angel's message. Mm-hmm. What are the verses from Revelation 10? I don't have them on the top of my head. Um, just, just 10-1 is the cloud. 10-1. <coughs> it's not oh, yeah. No. Okay. I, I thought you meant where it says uh, a cloud oh, is a tarrying. Oh, okay, yeah. And this is Revelation 10. And then we've said the second angel comes down at 9-11. And what are we sh- how are we demonstrating that? The same message. Mr. Mr. page 411, where she talks about that the, when those great towers were to come down, those great buildings in Revelation 18, 1, 2, 3 will be fulfilled. Okay, so we're going we're gonna to mark 9-11 with Revelation 18, one to three. Yeah? Did you want to say something? No, no, no one's applied. Oh, okay. So this is 9 11 then. So we, we, we've got here 9 11. Also the parable 10 versions, I think. Yeah. I'm only using the symbology that's, that's given in Second Chronicles to, to make that connection. So we know that in Ezra, this is not the eighth day of the first month. Okay, so we understand from the book of Ezra, this is the first day of the fifth month. And then you get the tenth day of the seventh month. But we're seeing the pattern of Ezra in the pattern of Second Chronicles without going into Ezra and, and, and picking that to pieces. So we're seeing that there's this issue of the priests and the Levites. So these become parallel symbols. Does that make sense? Yeah? If, we, if this is the 10th day of the 7th month, October the 22nd, 1844, this becomes a symbol of, of a shut door or the Sunday law. Are we okay with that? Mm-hmm. And we can demonstrate that this is the midnight cry. <coughs> yeah? So... In this story, what's happening, if we, the way it's laid out, the call is being made here to the 11th hour workers, or Israel. But can you see it's, it's after the Sunday, or it's out of sync? Yeah? Sorry? Okay, so you're, you're bringing in a pre-knowledge that you already have. But how do we, rest- how do we resolve, because we want to put this call here. It, it's, it's out. How are we going to do that? I'm trying to ask one of the, if one of the students know, because I, I know most of you already know, because you've already gone through this. You're saying why it, the characteristic of the Sunday law also on the midnight cry? That's what you're the Sunday law's here. Yeah. <coughs> and at one level, <coughs> I'm saying the Sunday law is talking about 723. This here is 723. And this is 721, mm-hmm. but that's where the siege begins. And this call is made before, because if you make the call afterwards, it's too late. Yeah. You left the one. Oh. 
Sorry. Because the Passover is at Sunday law. Mm -hmm. okay. Sister Tabina, what, what are you going to say? Um, I was going to say that you can put the 14th day of the first month, you can mark it also at 9 11. Okay. Then, then the second Passover in the second month would be Sunday law. So let's, so let's go ahead and do that then. So <coughs> we've got the 16th day from Second Chronicles, and this was the 8th day, and this was the first day. Yeah? That's just straight out of, out of Second Chronicles chapter 29. But if we turn this into a symbol, and this is the 16th day, let me put it up here. If this was the 16th, we could also say that this would be the 15th, and then this would be the 14th. So if we get this date and make it into a symbol, we can step back, three steps back. Does that make sense? And then this now is the 14th, because this was the 16th of the first. So symbolically, this now can become the 14th day of the first month. So here we have a Passover, which is the first Passover. That's, that's what you said, yes? That's the first part. And then what's the second step, you think? Do people get that? I don't know if, because we haven't studied the book of Ruth. There, there's, uh, I'm not answering your question, I just want to go back to the point that you just made. That once you've made the 16th the symbol there, it's really important to realize we're, no, we're, we're now stepping outside of just the realm of Second Chronicles in, in that context, and we're, we're coming back to the broader picture of our reform line. So now you've moved back to 9-11 as the 14th day of the first month, where now, now you've identified <coughs> the first Passover. And it's not the first Passover in connection with Second Chronicles anymore. Yeah. And it's important, I think, to make that break and under to understand that break. Because in Second Chronicles, there isn't, they didn't keep a, first there isn't a first Passover. But in this instance, there is. And so yeah. Like, this is... <coughs> In the second time, they actually had a sec an extra week to celebrate. Yes. I don't remember really looked at that into that light. Not me. So they were at least, no, I, I, have, I don't think I have really. <coughs> and also... Oh, what was your... Your the, word? I'm sorry. Sister, tell no, me. go ahead. I'll find out how much Your word, is your question answered now? Is the question answered? No, 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 no. not yet. What was your question? How are we going to get this call and move it back into this time period? We know that there is a closed door at the Sunday law. So if there is a closed door at the Sunday law, there must be a call before. Because there's a seven in there. Okay. Um, they were in captivity there for seven years. In the light of Se Ezra. Oh. In the light of Ezra 8, when they got to the river of Ahava, and Ezra had searched, uh, searched out to see what kind of people he had, there were no Levites. Yeah. So when they sent down, they brought back, they actually brought down the Levites and the Nethanims. And we know the Nethanims represent the 11th hour workers. And in the light of Ruth, also, we see the 11th hour workers are involved. So from my point of view, I see the Nethanims being called all the way back even from 9-11. Yeah, I, I don't, I'm not, I understand that, I understand that argument. We've created a first pass over here. Are we okay how we've done, are we, are we okay how we've done that? We've turned the 16th day into a symbol and then we've stepped back, three steps back. Yes, yeah, so you've got three steps, the first, second and third step. And so this becomes a, the first pass over. So we want to get this second Passover and we want to get this second Passover and bring it here, symbolically. So we're getting the history and we're using that history to allow us to make a prophetic... Uh, 
analysis of this. So we want to get this pass over and bring it here. So we want to pass over here. So this would be the second one. How do we go about doing that? That, that was my point. In yeah. I mean, that's simple. The, I think a huge part of how we do that is to understand that you've turned the 16th into a symbol. You've moved back to 9-11. And now you see that the first month's at 9-11. The second month, <coughs> the second Passover is a little later. <coughs> now you just have to answer the question of, of we're taking that history and we're superimposing it over the history that came before it. And so, so my point is, I mean, when, when you say the history that comes before it, what do you mean by that? The history that comes in the Second Chronicles, we have this history that goes from the first day of the first month all the way to the second day, or to the fourteenth day of the second. So from here yeah, to here. History. Yeah. And and so the important thing that I think to keep, because I don't know exactly what answer you're looking for, but I think the important thing to keep in mind is the part that you emphasize is that you've turned. Now, you've taken that history and you've made a break. You said you, you, you're, you're making a break. Now, you, you're saying, here's a call, right? And there's this history that comes too late when we made the prophetic application. So now you're taking that second part of that history from where this call is to, this, to the second Passover. And you're saying that history actually teaches the same lesson as the history that just preceded it from the first day of the first month to the 16th. So... It's really important, I think, in your, in your logic, if I understand you, that you take the 16th day of the first month, you make it a symbol, and you work backwards so you can show how this other history here can fit sequentially, or, sorry, superimposed over the top of that other history. So, we've created a first, a, a first Passover, and if we want to put this call here, we're going to have to make this the second Passover. So I'm just trying to understand how we would go about doing that, Brother Tyler. How are we going to move this from here to here? Um, one thing that I, or the easiest thing for me to do would be to know that the call goes from Dan to Beersheba, and that's the symbol of the midnight crown. <coughs> and it ends at the Sunday law. I don't know if that's you know, what you're looking for. but uh, Yeah, I'm not looking for anything specific. I'm, I'm trying to say, what if you're faced with this issue, that you, that, you, that you want to have this call, how do you go about explaining it to somebody? In you, in you, so you, you've gone from Dan to Bathsheba. Elder Jeff. I, I thought it was just for students, but I'm realizing that the students aren't saying anything about it. Yeah. My starting point before I dealt with the call of Dan to Bathsheba is I'd go to Daniel 8.14 and show that the Sunday law is the cross, and the cross is the Passover. So you've got a Passover there. And you've already got it up there with the 10th day of the 7th month. Okay, so the line of logic is that Daniel 8, 14, the 10th day of the 7th month, is the cross. And the cross, by definition, is the Passover. So you have to be able to put a Passover here. And you've already used up the first Passover. And the only other Passover that you have left is the second <coughs> Passover. Does everybody understand that logic? Mm -hmm. No? Yeah, I See, the disappointment what, what, uh, on October 22nd, 1844 is repeatedly illustrated by Sister White with the disappointment of the disciples immediately after the cross. There's a lot of reasons to prove it, but that makes it <coughs> simple. The disappointment after the cross is typifying, typifying the disappointment of October 23rd, 1844. October 22nd is the cross. The cross is the Passover. And that's the Sunday law. So I've got lots of hands up, but Brother Tabo says, is asked, I don't even know what you're doing. So let me step back to try and explain what I'm doing. All, when you go through all of this, this is just history. That, that, that's all it is. And you think, well, what's the point of understanding or knowing any of this history? And because we're all into 2520, we can all say, yeah, we need to know this history because 742, 677, 723 are all good dates to prove all the information on the chart, so we're going to use those dates. So at one level, 
what I've said is, well, let's see how we go about proving those dates. So we, we've done that briefly. We've got 65 years. We've got the connection between Hezekiah and Hoshea. And we've got the fourth and the sixth years connect these, uh, connection between these reigns. And so we can, we can demonstrate that 723 is correct. But then we notice that before this date, there's a call from Judah to Israel to come to a Passover. And that's just some historical fact. And you think, well, let's just ignore that. It doesn't make any difference if they did or if they didn't. But what I suggested was, and, and, and this is not my thought, this, is, this has already been established, but we're just going through this, is that this history here is important to us. Now, people have presented that the issue of 2 Chronicles 29 and 30 in isolation uh, on its own. So, have we all seen some kind of study about that? And the way it's normally approached is this. Because we're here <coughs> in the book of Ezra, the book of Ezra is open the first day of the first month and the first day of the fifth month. The Millerites understood this really clearly, Samuel Snow. His focus was this. Our focus is this. So this was the Millerites' focus, and this is our focus. But they're taken from the same passage. When you see that you have these two dates from the book of Ezra, what you're required to do is get this date here, and you do what with it? You turn it into... You turn it into a symbol. As soon as you turn this into a symbol, then you have the ability to go into scripture and start investigating all the verses that deal with the first of the first month. And as soon as it becomes a symbol, now what you're doing is proof texting. Because if you want to do proof texting on the Sabbath, you pick the word Sabbath and you find all the places that you see Sabbath. So you're doing exactly the same thing. This is proof texting, but you can only do that when you turn this into a symbol. So now it's a symbol, now you're going to find out everywhere that you see first day of the first month. And when you see that, what is it going to teach you? What is that going to teach you, Brother Tabo? Can you see what? Everywhere you see the first day of the first month, what is it going to teach you? Oh, uh, what happens Yes, I guess what I was asking for is, if it's a verse in the <coughs> book of Numbers, or Deuteronomy, or Isaiah, totally unrelated stories, they have no connection one with the other. But as soon as that you see that the first day of the first month, then you know that all of those three stories are all the same stories. So you're able to gather them and bring them into one place. So as soon as you do that, and then you can work out that the first day of the first month is 9-11. We've already discussed how you go about doing that through that logic. So then you're going to come to 2 Chronicles 29 in your studies. In 2 Chronicles 29 is going to be dealing with the first day, the eighth day, and the sixteenth. So... The first thing you know about Second Chronicles is this story is about 9-11. So you know that this is 9-11. And then you can see that in this story of 9-11 from the 1st to the 8th to the 16th, a number of things are being shown. The 1st of the first month is showing you 9-11, but the 16th day of the first month is what? What is that, Sister Alice, in the 16th day in, in the Hebrew calendar? When we're thinking about feasts, what, what is the sixth, what's happening on the 16th day? I think you mentioned it earlier on. Um, it's not the Passover? Passover is the 14th here. Oh, um, 14, 15, 16. That was Friday, then Sabbath, and now we're on Sunday in the, in the time of Christ. Pentecost. Sorry? Pentecost. No, Pentecost, is, is Pentecost means 50. So this is only the... What happens on Sunday? The resurrection. The resurrection. So Christ is resurrecting, and what does that resurrection represent? The first fruit. So the 16th is the first fruit. So when you start seeing that this is 9-11, then the 8th to the 16th, now you know here that the 16th is a symbol of the first fruits. So you can do an awful lot with Second Chronicles 29. You've got 9-11, you've got the first fruits, you've got the priests and the Levites, there's so much light that comes out of Second Chronicles 29. But 
when we looked at this history here, what we saw was that, yes, you can go into 2 Chronicles 29 and then into 30 where you have the call in the second Passover, but I'm putting it into a, into a historical framework because all of this is going on right here. And so this story here, 723, the 10 tribes, who is that at the end of the world? This is the 11th hour workers. So you've got the 11th hour workers here now, but just before that, you've got Judah making a call to the 11th hour workers to come out. Because who's just about to come? Who's about to destroy them? The king of the north. The king of the north is about to destroy it and take control of everything. And just before that happens, there's a call for them to come out. So what we're doing is we're taking 2 Chronicles 29, I guess this is for Brother Tabo, and 30, and putting it in a historical setting, which gives a prophetic framework on top of what you would just read if you just went to 2 Chronicles and picked, pick up the first day of the first month. There's two lines of thoughts, and both of them come on top of each other. And I, I think it gives added light. So that's why we're doing that. Your, your question is, what's our justification for making a break after the 16th day of the first month and repeating and enlarging <coughs> on the other history? What's your, and, and so you're looking for the answers, or the answer of how we're going to take that part of the history and bring it back. And part of the answer is you turn these things into symbols and you understand the history of 723 being the Sunday law. Therefore, this must be the history that precedes that the destruction comes. I, I, my, my, my thing is, because, I mean, that was, that was a really good recap. I think it was necessary. But are you trying to say the call from... <coughs> are you trying to place the call at the sun <coughs> or at the midnight cry? Is that what you're trying to do? And how do we do that? Yeah. The call at the Sunday Lord to the midnight cry. He hasn't focused on it being at the midnight cry yet. He's just focusing that there's a call that precedes it. He's got to get into the justification of placing it at the midnight cry. He's trying to show what, what's our justification for treating that as two lines that are applied line upon line. Okay. Mm -hmm. You know, often when we look at these dates and we say, you know, we're not into date setting or time setting, <clears throat> and we shouldn't get bogged down in that. But to me, the issue isn't so much that, it's that when we turn these dates into symbols, then they become powerful. It's not just some kind of avoidance scheme of saying, let's not get bogged down in time setting. It's, it's much more powerful than that. Because as soon as you take these dates and make them into symbols, you can do things with them that teach you truths that you can never understand. To me, that's why it's important to, to, to recognise when you get a history which has just got dates in it, what you're able to do when you turn them into symbols. So the 16th day, when you turn it into a symbol, of a 16th, and you can go from 16, 15, 14, then you can show that this is the Passover. You can do it other ways because you can, you, you can show that 9-11 at one level is, is the cross. But just on this, just with this limited amount of information, if you don't know all the ways of doing it, you can just do it through these, this, this small chapter, and you can show it powerfully that this is the first Passover. So once you've turned it into a symbol, you've created the first Passover, and my question was, how are you going to get the second Passover and bring it, bring it here? So one of the arguments is that you're going to go from Dan to Bathsheba. Uh, we haven't explained exactly what, 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 what that would do with you, because that becomes a symbol. But we know that Daniel 8.14 is here, and Daniel 8.14 is the cross. And why is it the cross? We were told a minute ago. Is because Ellen White's going to parallel the disappointment for the Millerites on the 10th day of the 7th month with the disappointment of the disciples at the cross. <clears throat> so she parallels those things together. So that's why we can make this the cross. And this is the cross, this is Passover. And the only other Passover that you have in this history is this one. So you can get this and move it here where it becomes a symbol at this point here. Sorry, repeat that. Why is it the second Passover? It because you've already got the first here. Ah, okay. You've already okay, got yeah. the first Passover, and then the second Passover. I'm not trying to go lay deeper and deeper, because 
you'll see that only certain people are allowed to go to certain Passovers. Yeah. You're only allowed to go to the second one under strict criteria. We all, we all know that. So I wasn't dealing with that. Uh, Sister Bronwyn. In my mind, when you take that Passover that you laid out on 16, I don't know why we automatically jump back to the midnight cry. It seems like if that is the 16th, the Passover, and there has to be a first and a second to have the third, then you would have to bring the call back to 9-11 to accurately line it up. I don't know why you keep bringing it to the midnight cry, what the justification is for starting it there. It feels like it should start again at 9-11, the call. I don't know how to say that. I understand what you're saying. It, it really wasn't my purpose to say that the call is only going to be specifically here or in this period. I was just trying to take it out of here and bring it into, in, into a history that, would act, that it actually becomes effective. Okay. Because I'm going to mark this as 723. So I wanted to show how you would show that this call actually happens before. Okay. Because historically, when you, when you lay out these numbers, it's happening in, in a sequence that's not correct. And, and in doing that, Hopefully, it, it shows you some of the reasoning behind how we jump from dates to symbols and how we can use those things. The 16th day is the first fruits, is what yes. you're saying? So what's the 15th day? First day of unleavened bread. Unleavened bread, and then the 14th is the Passover. Passover. Another way to say this, is it not possible to say that there are two temple cleansings? Yeah. And we read in Second Chronicles 29 that there is a temple cleansing, and after that there is a Passover. So if there are two temple cleansings, there are two Passovers. Just in general. And we know that there is a temple cleansing starting at 9-11. Okay. Uh, and Sister White um, refers to the temp two temple cleansings as the two calls uh, of Revelation 18. Yeah. Um, Brother Tyler, the Dan to Bathsheba. So it marks Dan to Bathsheba in chapter 30, and some people want to pull this call right back to here. And you want to keep it here? <coughs> so, yeah, sorry, continue. Um, based on well, like Michael said before, you're introducing a number, another symbol, so you would have to go into Dan to Beersheba and look at Dan to Beersheba and do a proof text on that. And when you do that, you find that there's no other place for it other than the <coughs> Midnight Cry. And <coughs> so, yeah, Midnight Cry to the Sunday Lux. Okay. Me, and you're sort of locked into that point of it. So when you come back to the history here, it says there's this call made from Dan to Beersheba, then Dan to Beersheba becomes a symbol. And when you run through that symbol, then you begin to see that it's, it's going to be from Midnight Cry to the Sunday Law. And then you can introduce Ezekiel 37 into this narrative to, to bolster that position. All I wanted to do was to show how you can get a history which has got dates and times <coughs> and events and turn all of that into a symbol that actually has some end time application. And also to show you the logic that you could use in a really simple way. You, you don't have to know an awful lot to just be able to run somebody <coughs> through these steps and show how you do it. Whether or not they would agree with you, you may, they may not agree that you're going to get this and turn it into a symbol. You know, you might have to take some, some other studies with them to, to demonstrate how and why you do that. But assuming a person would be accepting that you can turn dates into symbols, you can see how you can get this story and turn it into, I think, a really powerful uh, application at the end of the world. So that's why we looked at that. This is beyond a uh, uh, recap, right? Or, or is it all that, that we recorded in the first week and the second week? This was, this is, this, we, we discussed all of this. This is, a, this is a recap. I've gone into a bit more detail because when, I, when we said it the first time, I just said that's what it was. That's what was happening. But now I'm saying, now that you've had time to understand and know that that's what this history is, it happens here, these are the chapters that we'd be dealing with, what would you go do with it? If you're having a study with somebody, 
how would you go about approaching it? So that's what we've just done here, just to sort of say, say you know, there's a way, because it's one thing to say, these are the histories, this is what it is, and just give someone the answer. But it's a tough challenge, I think, for me, is to say, well, well how do you go about leading someone through this? So, so that was the purpose of what we're doing. So, it's, so we've gone past the review in that sense, just to say, well, let's walk through how we'd go about doing it together. One more comment on your Hosea, this, the Hezekiah 4 and 6, and how you labeled that out. I probably wasn't here on that class, but what I, I had learned earlier is that Christ tells the end from the beginning, so if you went to the end of that prophecy and broke down, I think there was a 19 and a... Oh, I can't remember, I have to look at 46. my notes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 46, that you would take those dates and that also would be a proof for how we get to 723. Are you not comfortable using that method? I would be if I understood how you, what, what you're okay, saying. Okay, it's... She's <laughs> using the history at the end of the Miller history to prove it backwards. Yeah, is that, is that what you the mean? the back end, yeah, I can... <coughs> it's a prophetic mirror. It, it, okay, yeah, but Christ is the end from the beginning, so you would go to someone and prove to them that, and then you would, right at the end of it, in 1798, when the end of six, um, 677, right? No. I'm sorry, 1798, the end of the 723. So you're going to get these three dates here. Yeah, that, that's right. And you've got your 19, your 46, and you have that same symbol at the end. I never knew there was another way to prove it, actually. So, so, so this is, you go backwards. Um, why can't you do that? Or why is that a bad method to approach it? I, I think it depends who you're talking to. Yeah. Okay. Most people who, got, who are going to have a problem with the 2520, um, they, they're going to have real problems that you're going to get this history here and try and, uh, and try and work backwards to it because what we're trying to do when we do this, we're trying to understand the relationship between this date and these two. And, and the church doesn't see a connect between them. So if you're going to use this as the proof of how you demonstrate the beginning, so the beginning would be 742, 723 and 677, and you've got 46 and 19, we tend to use this to, we, we use this history to explain this history. Because most people who are going to stumble at this, th the first thing they're going to tell you is time no longer. And now, you've, okay. now you're introducing time and, it, and okay, right. you can use it. But the, all, all of us can work backwards, but this is, this is a discussion of how you talk to somebody who doesn't see much of this history. Um, so this, this explanation up here, the Hezekiah and Hosea, that's, everybody has already commonly recognized that, because I just never... The, the story that. about Hezekiah, Second Chronicles 29, this is what we're talking about, isn't really, a, isn't really a proof of the 2520. That wasn't the purpose of it. Okay. The purpose of that was, Second Chronicles 29 has been, has been um, studied and presented many, many times before. And I was just trying to put it into the historical context of the 2520. Okay. And when you do that, you begin to see that what we've taught about down to Bathsheba is equal 37, the joining of the two sticks that begins here and is complete here, this call, the ploughing of, of, the, of the length of our workers, all has their, their roots right back into this story here. That, that was, it, wasn't, it wasn't a proof of the, of the 2520 per se. The 2520 proof was you can, you can calculate these dates with, with these reigns here. Okay. Thank you. Just as a, I'm sorry for interjecting this into your study. Your study is very nice. But when the 2520 was discovered in this history, it came from the articles by Hiram Edson. And if you read the articles by Howard <coughs> Edson very carefully, he points you to the history that Parminder is putting up there. He, he was basing it upon that. But when it came to light, what it did for this movement is it confirmed things about Millerite history that they had been looking at. And suddenly the number 46 and those details of the Millerite history became profound. And those of us that had an aptitude for and a willingness to see these things, we focused in on how these 2520s impacted the Millerite history 
and it became the predominant thing that was presented. But in reality, right from the very start, Hiram Edson had pointed us to the beginning, and what he's doing is he's going back and putting the beginning in place so that we can use the beginning to bring these other lines onto, and it's, it's strengthening now, what we, I guess in a way you could say, which we took for granted when we first recognized the 2520. That's why I think you and others have been preconditioned to look at the end to make <coughs> the proofs of this, but we need to look at it all. We then looked at Carchemish, and we saw that Carchemish becomes a what? Symbol. Becomes a symbol. So, I don't know if repetition is to... Carchemish becomes a symbol. And this is who? Josiah. This is Josiah. And this is? Jehoiakim. Jehoiakim. And we can demonstrate that Jehoiakim is 9-11 <coughs> and then at one level this becomes the time of the end and then Josiah also is 9-11 because Josiah is going to be killed, he receives a warning and then he's killed at 9-11. Mm -hmm. So we juggle those symbols around. <coughs> but we're going to look at Carchemish to teach us what about the time of the end. Long drawn out war. Yeah, so this is Daniel 11 verse 14. It's going to give us part A and part B. Part A is showing us what? The king of the south pushes against the king of the north. Who's the king of the north in this history? This is Assyria, and this is Egypt, and Egypt is in an alliance, it's a threefold alliance. This is Babylon, Medo-Persia, and Egypt. And we focus on these two parties. The Egyptians bring down, or help to bring down the Assyrian Empire, and it's this it's a continued warfare that's going on for quite a while. And then we come to this history here. And what's this history? So this is between Egypt and Babylon. But the Medes and Persians are there too. And who's <coughs> going to win now? I'll do it the other way. So here we have the king of the south being defeated by the king of the north and the two horn power is going to be assisting them. This is 1989 and this is 1798. So we see the history of Carchemish at the beginning. All this at the beginning is typifying this history at the end of the world. So we, we can see that Carchemish shows us that our understanding of these things are correct. So if we're going to make Carchemish here the time of the end, this too then becomes the time of the end. And that's one of the justifications we have for making 1798 the time of the end and 1989 the time of the end. And what, we, what we need to do in that logic when you're speaking to somebody is if we did this 1798 to 1844 <coughs> and we went 1989 to Sunday law, the time of the end begins here and it runs through history. We're in the time period of the time of the end. But what must we do? We must make a we must make this break here. If you don't teach that there's this break here, you lose your ability to say that this is a type of this, or you can get this and lay it over the top. Because most Adventists who believe or agree that something significant happened in 1989. When you, when you just make this this way, they don't see it, that, it, that it's the time of the end. They just say it's sometime in the time of the end. And there's a big difference between the two. But Carchemish teaches us that, that these two things become the same thing. And the, the way you do that is by turning 
<coughs> dates, histories, battles into symbols. And when they become symbols, then they become, then they become powerful because they become the same thing. This is proof texting. In a way, I don't think the Millerites were using really. They, I don't think they comprehended proof texting in that way. And this is why there's this big issue between how we understand scripture and how the church understands it. Because we've taken proof texting to levels that nobody would ever dreamed about. And when it gets introduced to a regular Seventh-day Adventist, they just think this is madness. Because they, they have no clue about proof text and even the simple way that the Millerites did it, although they have some understanding of that. And so when we take it to this level, it becomes a real issue. So this is an issue, I think, a term that's been used in the past of methodology. The method that you're going to use to interpret scriptures is what's going to test you in this time period here. This is the test. The test is about methodology. How you go about understanding scripture. And if you don't understand it this way that you can take dates, names, places, and turn them into symbols and use that to proof text, you, you're in a, you, you just can't understand what we're talking about. It just becomes a <coughs> foolishness. Brother Jonathan, they think what we're teaching is foolishness. That's what I meant by that. Yeah. I have a short question because I wasn't there at this presentation. Could you explain me very quickly why um, the king of the south is Egypt in alliance with Medo-Persia -Pers and Babylon? Okay, so what we're doing is we're overla always overlaying history and seeing how that impacts us prophetically. <coughs> if you go back into the history, you can see that Egypt is going to make war at Carchemish. Josiah gets in the way of, this, uh, of, this, of the Egyptians, tries to get involved and gets killed because he doesn't receive the warning that there's this, that there's this warfare happening. And you can see in his death, um, Islam being brought to view. So you understand about that. And so we have Egypt coming against Assyria. Yeah. But there's this threefold... Are you asking about the threefold? Yeah, I'm asking on the threefold... This one or this one? The left. This, this one. one, yeah, because Babylon, Medo-Persia should be actually king of the north. So one thing this is teaching us, that at the beginning of the war, and then when you get to the end of the war, there's a subtle change between who the king of the north is. Here, the king of the north is the Assyrian Empire. And here, the king of the north becomes Babylon because Assyria is taken, out of the, taken off the throne at this stage. So the ba first it's the Assyrians and it's the Babylonians. So that's one thing. There's a change in the king of the north. But the other thing is the Babylonians and the Assyrians are essentially the same entity. You can trace back their roots and they're the same power. They're like cousins. If, I'm not saying they're literally cousins. But they're the same. So at one level they're the same, at another level they're different. So 1798, this is the papacy pre-deadly wound, and this is the papacy post-deadly wound. It's still the king of the north, still the papacy, but there's some differences to it. So you can see that in that history. So that's one point. Then the other point is, why is this threefold union being brought to view? When you take that symbol of the threefold union and you bring it into Daniel 11 verse 40 if uh, this is Daniel 11 verse 40 so this is 40 and then you can get to even beyond but if we went to say 42 <coughs> or 44 I'll just go to 45 this history here is the rise of the threefold union, how they're going to come together. So this threefold union, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet, the story from 1989 to the Sunday law and up to the close of probation, maybe I should do it this way. This would be 45 and this would be 44. This threefold union, how it's going to rise, is this story that's being brought to view here. But 1989 is also this story here. Now, at one level, when you take symbols, you can go from this symbol to this symbol and have this progressive history that's being discussed. But because they're the same symbol, you can overlay them one on top of the other. You can interchange them. So here, the king of the south delivers a deadly wound to the king of the north, 1798. But this is also a story that you have a threefold union that's been brought to view. 
So we can take this threefold union, which is marked by Karkamish, which is marked the time of the end, and we can get this and put it on top of here. So at one level, 1798 and 1989 are the same thing. And if you do that, then you can see that this threefold union is being discussed here at 1989. So there's a threefold union from the beginning to the end, but the dynamics of this role threefold union are different to how it started. So I think I'm confusing you from the expression on your face. I think the part, <laughs> I think the part you may be leaving out of, his, of the answer that he may okay. be seeking for is that you haven't told them that in that history up there, Egypt was in alliance with the Medes and Persians in Babylon. That's a historical fact. Ma yes, so I don't know if that was part of the... the there's a threefold union that these three people are together. Uh, in the history. Okay, yeah. But as soon as you start turning these into symbols, you can start taking points of that history and applying them in different ways, overlaying one on top of the other. So one part of the history that, that we concentrate on is the struggle about Egypt and the King of the North. That's where our focus normally lies. But also in that history, there's a threefold union that's brought to view. And that threefold union that's brought to view... You're calling this threefold union also the King of the South. He's the King of the South. This threefold union, if you want to start bringing this to the end of the world, then you're going to start applying that symbol differently because this is the false prophet. This is the dragon and this is the beast. So you have the dragon, the beast and the false prophet already embedded in that history. So what we're doing is we're saying we can recognise in that history the threefold union is all coming together to make war or to take over the world. And that's what's happening here. So however way you look at this, you can, if you look at it just on a simple level, you can just see these two nations warring against, it, warring against each other and then it develops into a further argument where the threefold union begins to infight and war against each other. And we know that's, that's what's going to happen here because at the Sunday law, the false prophet dies. Without going into all the intricacies of it, what I, all I'm saying is this, there's a threefold union brought to view here at the beginning and there's infighting between the threefold union that, that you see at the end. And you see the same thing in our history. The threefold union is being formed and as you get to the end, they begin to struggle and war against each other to say who's going to gain the ascendancy. I, I think in is it Malachi Martin's book, yeah. Keys of His Blood, he deals with this issue about... He doesn't understand all the dynamics that we understand, but he knows in 1989 there's a threefold war that's going on between the USSR, the USA and the papacy. And he realises someone's going to win that fight. And he says the person who's going to win the fight at the end of the, at the, end of the day is the papacy. So he recognises, he's not dealing with the threefold union in, in, the, in the way that we do, but he realises there's a struggle between the United States and the papacy. And one of them is, even though they're helping each other here at the end, they're going to have a fight with each other and one's going to lose and one's going to win. So it's the same history that's being brought to view there. Okay. I'm confused by the 9-11. Karkamish um, didn't get quite... <coughs> the 9-11 oh, the, the bit, this is, this is where it gets confusing because 9-11 is being marked by Jehoiakim. Kim. <coughs> and this Karkamish is in the fourth year of Jehoiakim. Right. So it, 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 it was just adding another layer, because if this was 9-11, you can show, if you're going to do a reform line, that this would be time of the end. You have time of the end, and then 9-11. But, but I didn't really focus on that, because I'm, I'm saying at, at, at the level that we're discussing, this is the time of the end also. I really think it's worthwhile spending some time grappling with this in your mind to get to grips with it, so that, for one thing, that you're confident in your own mind, from your own studies, that 1989 is the time of the end. That it's not just jumping through some Bible verses and some words that you've heard in a presentation and you say, oh, that all looks good, it must be so. That if you can see that it is history repeating for yourself, that you know that you're standing upon the word of God, 
not upon a construction of man. And when you're teaching it to someone else, that's the purpose of what you're trying to do. You're trying to say, we didn't make up um, Daniel 11 verse 40 part B and part A. We didn't make this up and just say, we want to split the verse and, and do it this way. You can go back into prophetic history and show it was so. Because these are Bible verses. They're not just, you know, Carchemis isn't just invent some battle that you go into Wikipedia and find out about. It's in the scriptures. So we went through Carchemis, we looked at the Hissin, um, we had a brief review of Daniel, uh, Daniel 8 and 9, and we looked at Nineveh. We've looked briefly at Nineveh. So I just want to spend a few moments on Nineveh. That now, hopefully, you've looked at it and had a bit of time to think about Nineveh. What do we know about Nineveh? Why are we looking at Nineveh? So just that, so that we know, what are we talking about when we say Nineveh? What, what are we referring to? We're referring to the Battle of Nineveh. <clears throat> and what's the year of the battle, Brother Henry? Sister Tiffany? Remember? 627. This is AD. Why are we looking at the Battle of Nineveh? It's the key, but why, one step back for the key, why are we looking at this? What would be the purpose of doing that? Okay. This is the second witness that we have for Daniel, for Daniel 11.40. Do we remember that? This is the second witness that we spoke about. This is the second witness for Daniel 11 verse 40. Yeah? But it's going to give us some more information on top of that. It's going to allow us to see that with the second witness, now we're going to have the introduction of <coughs> Islam into this story. Oh, yeah. so introducing it's introducing Islam, but the primary, when we discussed it in class, the primary purpose of looking at this was the second witness for Daniel 11 verse 40. Yeah? So let's just have a quick review of that, of Nineveh. And this is in the year 627. There's lots of things that we could discuss about this, but this is Revelation chapter 9. Revelation chapter 9. And Nineveh is between what two empires? <clears throat> the war or the battle, it's the same. Who's, who are the two? And, and Rome. So... I'm going to call it the Eastern Roman Empire today. If I can even spell Eastern. I'm missing something. E-R-N. E-R-N, I thought, yeah. That's why I like pagan Rome. Okay, and the Persians. One thing that we haven't discussed, we call this often the Byzantine Empire. Why do we call it the Byzantine Empire? Because, because it has nothing to do with Rome. when we go through the geography, remember this was my crude picture of <coughs> Europe. <clears throat> this is the Mediterranean Sea with the two pinch points going into the Black Sea. This is North Africa. This is the Bothra Straits. This is the Straits of Gibraltar. Before Constantinople, which is here, was ever called Constantinople, it was called Byzantium. So the town here was originally called the town of Byzantium. Constantine, 330 AD, moves the capital from uh, Rome to Byzantium and he renames it Constantinople and now it's called Istanbul. So the term Byzantine comes from the word or the name of the original town, Byzantium. So that's why it's called the Byzantine Empire because they want to try and make this distinction and I think we struggled in class, some people did, when I want to call this pagan Rome. By the time you get the split um, in the 5th century, people want to start calling this something different. They don't want to keep on calling it pagan Rome. So the word that they use is the Byzantine Empire, which is the original roots of, of where it came from. So, we've got a long drawn out war. It culminates in 627. 
But this war has been going on quite a bit before this. And it starts around, I'm going to put around 610. What's happening in 610 is that there's an emperor in Constantinople and his friends with the Persians who live here. He gets killed by a rival emperor who wants to take the throne. And his name is, if I can pronounce it correctly, Focus. Um, so he gets killed, Focus takes the throne, and the Persians begin to make war against Constantinople, against this emperor, because of what he's done. A few years later, he gets seated off the throne, taken off the throne, and Heraclius comes on the throne. Heraclius is the is now the emperor, and he's going to start making war against Persia. So this is the why this war begins between the Persians and the Romans or the Byzantine Empire, and it's going to culminate in the Battle of Nineveh. Initially, at the beginning of this war, around this kind of time here, the Persians were in the ascendancy, and Rome was being defeated. But by the time you get to this point, then Rome is in the ascendancy and the Persians are taken off the scene. So you can see that there's this long drawn out war that's being discussed. You've got these two protagonists. First the Persians are, rule, uh, are on the rise and against the Romans and, and then it switches over that the Romans finally come and attack them suddenly <coughs> with a surprise and the way they do that they go round the Black Sea and they come round into the underbelly of Persia and they make their final attack. Surprise. Surprise, sorry. So the question is we know that Rome here can be considered the King of the North. So here we have the King of the North but how do we get Persia to be the King of the South? Because you really can't do it because there's no, there's no perfect way, Mark, to make Persia the king of the south. But a little bit before 627, in this time period here, before this time period, in this locality here, this is Egypt. Egypt was held in control by, by pagan Rome, by the Roman Empire. They had control of Egypt. But in the year 619, the Persian Empire took control of Egypt and they held control of Egypt from 619 to just after 627. I think it's about 629. So in this battle, in this warfare, Persia is controlling or owning the territory of Egypt and that's the historical and prophetic reasoning to, to see that Persia is considered to be the king of the south. But it's after it, it's, a, it, it, it's, it's a little bit after this one, but it's well within this history here. No, I mean it's not, oh. uh, if you take it symbolically, the king of the south. Yes, <coughs> yes, I'm taking the symbol of the king of the south. But it's not in the south, it's not about being in the south. Geographically in the south, right? Yeah, it's about yeah, being an atheist Africa. nation. Or controlling Egypt. Who is the king of the south? The one that, that is a a represents atheism. Yeah. yeah. At this point in time. So it doesn't have to do anything with the country of Egypt, I think. Okay, I w from my mind, I was trying to see how we're going to make Persia into a king of the south. Yeah, but I think you cannot do this because the king of the south doesn't have to do anything anymore with Egypt as a geographically located nation in the south at this point in time. Okay. Because it's, it's after, after the cross? cross. Yeah. Is that right. what you're trying because to apply? Because after yeah. the cross? You yeah. understand what I mean? I, I understand the point. I don't have an answer to that, I don't think. I like what you're saying, and, and I'm not threatened if that is the right way to get there. But the way some of us get there is because the Persians, at the symbolic level, 
are one horn of the Medes and the Persians, and therefore they are the two-horned power, which typifies France in 1798. Um, and you can approach it that way as well. So, I think people caught that. The, the Persians are part of the realm of the Medes and Persians, which is the two-horned power, which is Revelation 11, which is France, which is Sodom and Egypt. Is that that's what you're saying? Yeah. yeah. Also, um, the, uh, at this time, Rome isn't even the king of the north; it's the papacy. Yeah. So, so my my point in saying that is that we already are doing something here that we're taking. A, this is a symbol. You know what I mean? They're not controlling. They're 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 not the king of the north. Well. No. Yes. But yeah. symbolically, because it's Rome, it would be. So, Rome, in this instance, Eastern Rome, is not the king of the north. It's <coughs> Persia, the king of the south. It's only when you take this and you compare it. Their characteristics. Their characteristics, yeah. With the king of the south and the king of the yeah. north. Yeah. Because his, I mean, Papacy is the king of the north at this moment. And we then looked at Revelation 9 that um, the star, I think it's, what if I just quickly read Revelation 9, make sure I don't get the wording incorrect. Verse 1, And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And so once this warfare happened, and Persia was taken off the scene, then Islam, <coughs> which was boxed in by the Persian Empire, then is able to, to come out of its pit, rise, and begin to make war against um, the Byzantine Empire, the armies of Rome. And so this battle of Nineveh is this key that's unlocked and opens up the ability for Islam to come to the ascendancy and rise. And we marked that at 1989. So 1989, after this long drawn out war between the King of the South and the King of the North, when the King of the South is defeated, then Islam is able to rise. And, you, we, and we discussed that between 1979 and 1989, there was a 10 year war where the USSR was containing or bottlenecking radical Islam in Afghanistan, which is the same dynamic that, that was going on here. So, um, and then we've discussed down you too, which we don't obviously have time to go through now. So that's what we discussed in, in the morning classes with me. Let's close with prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your loving kindness and your goodness towards us. As we realise the sacredness of this message and in the time in which we live in, we ask, Lord, that you would speak to our hearts individually, that you would motivate us, Lord, to spend time in your word, confirming and reaffirming whether these things are so, so that we may be able to stand upon them by ourselves and for ourselves. But Father, we know that an investigation of the Hazon vision does more than give us facts and figures. Through the work of the Holy Spirit and the power of your word, which is the living testimony, an investigation of prophetic history speaks to our hearts and our minds and has the power to change us in a way that we little realise. Even though your prophet has told us that if we had a better, clearer understanding of the books of Daniel and Revelation, we would have an altogether different religious experience. <clears throat> Father, we know that this is what your will for us. May it be our desire to enter into this experience. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Mm -hmm.